Uh, Drew Schulke, uh, I run the product management team here at Dell AMC Networking. Um, and uh, I'm also joined by uh, Tomo Isaka, who will be kind of tag teaming here with the demo. So we'll have a demo in the room, so don't have to worry about the over the over the wire stuff. Um, but I want to cover our, our recent announcements in terms of what we're doing in the SD-WAN space. Um, and again, s similar theme here, which is a lot of close collaboration with VMware um, in terms of bringing together a, a joint offer into this particular marketplace. And I, I've watched these tech field days in the past, I know you've covered SD-WAN a great many times, so this isn't like a, not like a new topic that we're bringing into here. But, um, you know, just kind of quickly recapping why this is such an interesting space for us at this point in time. Just about every customer that we talk to, it's very rare that we don't come across somebody interested in addressing some of the two main problems that they have with their wide area network. One, that they've had this, you know, complex myriad of physical appliances spread all over the earth that they need to manage. Uh, often on a box by box basis. And then two, just as traffic is exploding and we're driving more traffic into the public cloud and other SaaS applications, keeping my transport cost in terms of what I'm actually paying every month for those circuits under control um, is, a, is a key point for us. And so even we as Dell Technologies, our IT department has been going through this <laughs> transition right now. Um, and, and the savings as we've been able to move over is, is very substantial in, in the tens of millions of dollars that we've been able to take, uh, take on in terms of shifting some of our traffic off of dedicated MPLS circuits and more onto broadband. So um, it's, it's an easy conversation to have with customers. You know, the question to have is, hey, Dell EMC, VMware, kind of what's the, what's the value, what's the better together story here? And I'll, I'll take you back a little bit in time, which is even prior to VMware buying VeloCloud, we at Dell EMC were getting pulled into a lot of conversations around devices at the edge. Um, and specifically in the networking business unit, we were getting pulled into these conversations around some of the larger telcos and service providers who were interested in pushing out um, you know, multiple network, uh, virtual network functions into their customer base and, and supporting those as a managed service. And so we started talking about the hardware requirements with them and putting some products on our roadmap, you know, x86 boxes with data plane acceleration capabilities, multiple, uh, you know, uh, network connectivity options, small form factors, cost effective form factors. And then kind of in parallel, we see this, you know, we had VMware by VeloCloud and all of a sudden there was like this SD-WAN play that was taking advantage of a lot of the similar infrastructure. And so what we ended up having is the ability to intercept with some building blocks that we had on the hardware side uh, to power these edge devices with a, you know, a leading software-defined WAN solution coming into VMware um, and, and bringing these together. Um, you know, it's software-defined, uh, you know, software-defined WAN, obviously, but there is still this edge device. And so what we at Dell EMC, prior to that as Dell, we've been building a lot of x86 devices for a very long time. <coughs> Secure supply chain is a key topic for most, most of our customers that we're trying to bring into the space as well. Um, and then just our, our sheer global footprint so that we can support customers that want to drop these all over the world in every single country and support it on the back end with the service logistics capability. And so we're trying to bring that kind of physical reach of the Dell EMC machine, combining it with the great story that we have with SD-WAN and VMware, and the combination of those two we're very excited about. So kind of the, the divvying up of responsibilities, you know, we have these appliances. Um, they will ship preloaded with the VMware software on them. Um, so when I power them up in the uh, remote location, um, it's ready to go, it's plug and play. We maintain our own orchestrator as Dell EMC. <clears throat> the orchestrator is what you go into to interface with everything you want to do in the wide area network, you know, debug what's going on with this edge device, set your policy and so forth. And we're bringing that under our control as well because as we look at like a cohesive support experience, it's difficult to decouple this thing from that orchestration as I'm looking to go in and troubleshoot what's going on. And so we wanted to have that cohesive support. On top of that, you know, the software clearly is from VMware and we're leveraging their OTT network. So we're taking advantage of all the virtual cloud gateways that they have put all over the globe, literally, uh, in terms of the major point of presence, um, all the major public cloud providers, and, and that's how the, the story comes together between the two companies. So kind of like quickly hitting on the, the, the three key areas, there's the SD-WAN edge device. These are x86 devices. Um, we, we like x86 here at Dell EMC a lot. Um, so it's kind of in our wheelhouse to go off and design these comes preloaded with the software. We have the orchestrator that we talked about. That's again, we have our own operations team that'll help get you onboarded and get these devices activated as they deploy out. 
and then VMware provides their own OTT SD-WAN gateway. So that's kind of the, the trinity in terms of what we're bringing together here with this offer. So kind of any questions on that before we turn it over into... The SD-WAN orchestrator, there's no internal self-deploy on-site inside of a data center for a customer type model? Like you have to go into the your cloud essentially for this or did I misunderstand? Well, I, you as a customer need to exist in that orchestrator so I can get you to onboard that device. Now there's a couple of ways I can do it. I can push or I can pull. Yep. So there's, there is an option. So if I want to, you know, be, if I wanted to be there physically and say, okay, I want to activate this device only when I want to activate it, that's a, that's a pull option that you can go off and do as opposed to a push. So are we talking about the VeloCloud orchestrator? Correct. Under yeah, so that's and so we've kind of like a rebrand. We, we've created a Dell EMC instance of it. Okay. Yep. So it's is do both of them end up coexisting, or they this co is the new thing going forward? They coexist. So there's still okay. a, a sales motion. I mean, VMware will continue to sell the the VeloCloud okay. offering, and they've got an active, uh, you know, go to market on that, and winning a lot of business. You know, has a lot of business with some of the telcos with their offerings. That continues to exist. Um, this is a. a just another go-to-market path in terms of a support model that comes with okay. it. Okay. Yep. Good question. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, I think this is kind of the setup for the demo. So, um, uh, Tomu Isaka is here. We actually have uh, a setup here actually in the room where we've got a wired and an LTE connection. Yep. And so I'm going to hand it over to you to take us home for the next few minutes on the demo. Yep. Thank you, Drew. Is uh, I don't know. If, I mean, this would be you or, or you, but yeah. you know, you Either said it's a different yeah. sales motion. Yeah. Um, just another channel, basically, for you guys. Is the code base the same? Yes. So there will be no divergence going forward. It's just a different, purely different marketing paths. Yeah, correct. Okay. And, and I think just in general, you know, where um, where Dell EMC has think about kind of white space in terms of SD WAN. You know, we're we're very deep into the enterprise and in the mid-market space where there's still a lot of interest in this. So we've got a lot of reach and touch in, in that particular area. And so that's going to be a lot of the focus of, of our go-to-market path, as opposed to going into the, the telcos and trying to support a managed service offering on it. Right. So what, I mean, I mean, I'm just curious why the decision was made really to have, you know, those two. I mean, obviously you want to have, I, I get the whole, you know, sales side of things, you know, and having, you know, kind of all that stuff going on. But I mean, just to have two different product names feels a little odd, I would, I would say, you know, or a little confusing potentially in the market. So that's why I'm curious what, why that decision was made to go that direction. Um, well, I would say there's a great many customers, you know, that do the, do the Venn diagram of VMware and Dell EMC, and yes, there is overlap. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of non-overlap in, in that space yeah, where sure. we've got, a, we're the trusted advisor and we have that relationship. <clears throat> so the ability to have you know, our brand and name on that becomes a lot more palatable because we have existing enterprise license agreements and things like that that we can tap into um, as opposed to trying to, you know, bring an, another partner into the story. Uh, you know, conversely, okay. they've got, you know, footprint where we don't. And so we saw it as very complimentary as, you know, expanding the pie. Okay. All right, thank you. So, yes, um, what we have set up here is a Dell EMC a 610 appliance, so it's connected to the Dell corporate MPLS, and you might not be able to see it here, but uh, I have a couple of uh, LTE modems. One is connected via Ethernet. This is a uh, AT&T, uh, 4G LTE, uh, and the other one is tethered via USB, uh, so this guy has two USB ports on the side uh, to connect our wireless LAN, so uh, this is just a, a Verizon uh, 4G LTE modem. So in total, we'll have uh, three WAN connections live. Uh, for this demo, but uh, we can support uh, up to eight uh, WAN interfaces uh, on this device. Uh, basically, just connecting them all to the available ports. Question. Yep. Is there an intent to actually bring in an LTE modem into the box? So, that's a good question. I believe we are going to release the uh, um, LTE model. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's. There, yeah, there, there are existing VeloCloud appliances that have the embedded LTE, and, and our, our roadmap on the Dell AMC side, we have an embedded LTE option as well. Okay. Thank you. Correct. Yeah, I think uh, the LTE is an uh, interesting time right now because we're in the transition from 4G uh, to 5G. So we, could come, uh, we already have an LTE model, but that will probably be obsolete pretty soon. Uh, so hence, we're going to probably have a next generation model for 5G support. So personally, I think uh, having the external modem, at least during that transition phase, uh, makes a little bit more sense so you're not stuck with an uh, obsolete uh, cellular radio. 
But uh, regardless, uh, we will be coming out with the uh, um, model of the edge that has the LTE radio built in. And just as a side, the 610 is the first in a series of uh, the next generation uh, edge appliances uh, for uh, VMware. Uh, and all the next gen um, hardware, regardless of whether it's Dell EMC branded or VMware branded, all that will be manufactured uh, by Dell. So it's going to be based on the same ch uh, chipset all manufactured uh, by Dell. So there's going to be uh, the Dell EMC branded box, which will have the, the black chassis and the traditional VeloCloud uh, chassis, which are, uh, I believe, going to be uh, having the white uh, chassis. So basically, uh, internally, we just say it's the white box or the black box. So the black box will be the Dell EMC box. There we go. So. Um, I'd like to show you really quickly uh, just the end-to-end -end, uh, activation flow for the 610. Uh, you may have seen this uh, in earlier demos for VeloCloud, but uh, uh, this is the latest uh, GUI interface. Uh, so everything uh, with respect to provisioning, uh, management, uh, and troubleshooting will be done through the VeloCloud orchestrator, uh, the VCO. The VeloCloud orchestrators, uh, as Drew mentioned, uh, will be hosted uh, in data centers and, and AWS instances. Uh, from the VMware side. Uh, however, uh, we do have a Dell dedicated uh, VeloCloud orchestrator or VCO that is operated by the Dell operations staff and is dedicated for uh, Dell customers and Dell partners. So there is delineation between uh, the VeloCloud orchestrators that uh, VMware uh, might be selling to as opposed to ones that are purely uh, Dell. And the ones that are uh, for Dell will be supported uh, through uh, Dell uh, Tier 1 and Tier 2 support. So uh, first, uh, when you activate uh, the edge, obviously, uh, you just have to have it plugged in uh, and have WAN connectivity. Uh, what we'll do here uh, is we will create a new edge. So we just give it a name, specify the model. So the latest generation of the VCO has support for the 610, and we assign a pre-built uh, profile. Um, and as additional layer of security, what we can do is uh, we could add a uh, asset tag uh, number for this configuration. So by entering the asset tag, and this is strictly optional, but by entering the asset tag, you can prevent somebody from uh, purchasing their own 610 and, and plugging in and activating their 610 uh, unauthorized and joining the, the SD-WAN um, using a, a bogus 610. So unless there's a match with the asset tag and the asset tag on this guy, uh, the registration will fail. So that's just an additional uh, security measure there. The rest of the process is, is fairly straight, uh, straightforward. We define the contact email uh, to send the activation email. Uh, since we're using multiple WAN links uh, and some of them are wireless, best practice is to manually define an IP, uh, uh, physical address. So this will be based on the lookup on Google Maps. So we see here that in Dell EMC Santa Clara uh, shows the correct address uh, for this facility. So uh, that's pretty much it for provisioning. So uh, if you don't specify the physical address, uh, the physical location will be based on GOIP lookup. But since we have wireless connections, as we know, GOIP lookup on wireless LTE may not always be accurate as far as physical location is concerned. And that's why uh, we're just entering the physical location manually uh, to override any of the GOIP uh, found um, physical location. So that's pretty much it for, uh, for provisioning on the back end. And the device is going to be activated. Uh, and the only other thing here is to send that activation email to the on-site technician. Uh, and the on-site technician will do the rest as far as activating the edge device. So this uh, email here shows the instructions as far as how to connect uh, and what URL to click uh, to the on-site technician. So we're just going to send that uh, to the on-site technician. So. In the course of uh, probably less than two minutes, uh, we were able to provision uh, this guy. But if we were to, say, plug in that guy and provision that, we just apply the same profile uh, and configure it. So it's just very, you know, very simple as far as provisioning. Uh, Question on that. Is there a time frame between that activation code and a uh, configurable setting here that says, if not activated within the next hour, five hours, day, yep. uh, we're not going to allow it? Yeah, so there's a business uh, answer to that, and there's also a technical answer to that. The technical answer is that activation key. I don't know if you see it there. Expires in a month. Yep. So, so if it expires, then you just regenerate a new one. But commercially, I believe the Dell um, agreements kick in after two months after. 60 purchase. days is 60, what we're giving. Yep. Okay. 
So um, regardless of whether you activate it or not, you're paying for it anyway, so you might as well activate it within that 60-day uh, time frame. So that's uh, one of the, uh, that's the commercial answer as far as uh, the activation timeline. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that is as far as I go as far as the, uh, the back-end provisioning. So now I'm just going to do a little bit of role play and switch hats and act the part of the uh, on-site technician. So what the on-site technician needs to do is they need to connect uh, to the uh, um, SSID, the Wi-Fi network uh, that's advertised out of the box um, by the 610 appliance. So uh, by default here, I'm not sure if you see it here, but <coughs> Bellow Cloud, Python, uh, this seven digit string, and sorry, my, uh, my pointer battery ran, ran out, so I'm going uh, manual here, but <laughs> Uh, basically, the seven-digit string is, uh, a, is a Dell ACID tag, and that's uh, basically unique for every single box. So you can tell uh, by that ACID tag number which, uh, which device you're connected to. So I'm already connected there. So if I'm playing the part of the, uh, the technician here, I just go to my inbox, and I see that I've received the edge activation inbox or email. I scroll down, and I already did the instructions, but basically uh, you connect to the SSID, and there's a default password uh, that's also defined out of the box. You just put that in your SSID uh, to connect uh, to the wireless. And then the rest, you just click on the, uh, the activation URL. And uh, probably a little bit hard to see, but you can also uh, use the same uh, activation URL on iPhone. So if you have the activation URL, it doesn't have to be a PC. It could be basically uh, any uh, Wi-Fi capable device that has a web browser. You just click on that. So you don't even have to have a PC on site <clears throat> but I'm just going to do it from the PC because it's a lot easier to see so if you act if you click on this activation email you'll see here it's automatically going to detect the internet status so we have three connections so whichever one is detected first is what's going to be used for the activation uh, all the other information is automatically populated uh, with the uh, activation uh, email uh, and once it's activated, um, you also see that if we defined a uh, Wi-Fi SSID, that Wi-Fi SSID that's going to be used for production uh, is also displayed on the uh, activation notification. So this tells us that activation was successful. If you look at the box here, uh, this guy's going to, uh, LED is going to turn red, and then it's going to turn bright green. Once it turns bright green, uh, that means that that box is uh, fully functional and activated. But uh, while the box uh, reboots and activates, let me just show you real quick some other stuff that uh, is on the profile. So on the profile that we have predefined on the VCO orchestrator, so I'm now kind of switching gears and playing the part of the admin again. On the profile here, um, we have by default what we call a quick start profile. So this is the profile that pretty much applies to all devices. What I did was I, I copied the uh, default profile uh, into the 610 profile that we're using for 610. So on the profile, I specify what kind of firmware image I'm gonna be using. I also specify uh, what exactly is the, uh, the username and password that's gonna be used in production uh, for the, uh, the local GUI on the box. <coughs> and I also specify some of the basic parameters uh, like uh, VLAN IP address, that up here. Um, actually, before I go to the IP addressing, well, the VLAN IP addressing, pretty simple. Just uh, define the VLAN IP address. So can this be uh, can this be zero touch provisioned and shipped out to a remote site? I mean, because I was hearing you say, you know, has to be done on site. You know, whatever, register it and blah blah yeah. blah, and then connect back to it. So if I want to ship this out to a remote office, yeah. already configured or mostly configured or whatever. Yeah. So we do have a um, beta uh, for for zero touch. I think. Technically, uh, what you're saying, the push activation, uh, it's um, not so hard to implement. Uh, logistically is what we have to figure out is, is how those serial numbers uh, get populated uh, out of manufacturing uh, so that the zero touch model actually is, is functional from a, a there, commercial there perspective. Some, there are also, yeah. also some channel partners that we work with that will do some of that pre-staging for, for a large remote deployment where we can tap into them. So those devices would ship to a central location they know where it's going. They're doing all that in advance, so it can be. But it is a, it is a touch. But we have the ability through that process to support that too. Yep. Okay. Um, so the IP addressing, pretty simple. Six ten specific information. Uh, just for example, uh, configuring the SSID. So 
just defining the SSID and the secret password. So these are really basic things that you could define on the profile. Uh, so I'd set that in advance. Oh yeah, and the other thing I, uh, I should mention is that uh, this guy uh, has uh, eight ports uh, built in, uh, including two uh, SFP ports uh, for uh, adding SFP modules. Um, and by default, uh, the first two ports are defined as uh, a LAN uh, interfaces, so you connect your switches or um, your devices to those uh, switch ports. But you could kind of flip these uh, ports to whatever purpose that you want. So uh, all those ports uh, can be modified from uh, being a routed LAN interface uh, to a switched, um, basically, LAN interface uh, according to your needs. So on the profile level or on the individual device level, you kind of uh, switch uh, between the usage of the port, so all eight ports uh, are pretty much dual purpose. So that's the uh, basics here. One other thing I want to highlight here is uh, cloud VPN. Uh, so this is a technology that's uh, unique to the VeloCloud SD-WAN solution. Uh, what cloud VPN does is it allows for one-click uh, site-to-site uh, VPN connectivity. It also allows for one-click uh, site uh, to like non-VeloCloud site uh, connectivity. So for example, we have automated configurations where an, uh, an edge could connect to like an Azure VNet instance, for example, or it could connect to uh, um, a cloud web security service like a Zscaler. All that could be defined uh, on this profile, and it's only one click. You just turn it on, uh, and you just define uh, what kind of VPN that you want to enable. And any edge that has that profile uh, will be able to uh, connect site to site uh, depending on what the rules uh, you configure. So right now, on this profile, I have configured uh, branch to branch VPN, a uh, hub and spoke uh, via our cloud gateways, uh, which means the edges will connect first uh, to uh, our cloud hosted Velo Cloud gateways and then connect back up to uh, another edge. So this is a useful uh, mechanism if you have any kind of firewall policies that, that block the direct branch to branch VPN. Mm. So uh, that, I think, is pretty much, oh yeah, one last thing here. One other adjustment I made on the profile is on the firewall side. So on the firewall, I just enabled a local GUI access. You don't really have to do this, but uh, to show the local GUI by default, all the, uh, the uh, non-VCO uh, management uh, interfaces are, are shut off, but you could turn them on uh, if you wanted to. You could actually see the C CLI as well. Um, but uh, we, by default, all these are deny all on the quick start profile, uh, but I've just enabled uh, local GUI access for all LAN interfaces, uh, just so I could show you on the demo. So I think the device is on its way uh, to be uh, booted up. So the LED is showing green, so that means the, the device is registered successfully. Uh, so if we go back to the actual GUI interface here, Oh yeah, make sure I need to make sure that I am connected to the correct SSID. So connecting back uh, to the SSID for the actual device itself and connected. So I'm on the local LAN, so I should have access uh, to the device local GUI. So you can see here, big difference is that uh, uh, if you connect to the local GUI after activation, uh, it's going to ask for the uh, username and password, and that's the same password, uh, username and password that. I defined on the profile. <coughs> so uh, we're into the GUI. Um, so the local GUI is just there for really monitoring purposes uh, or just factory resetting the box uh, if for any reason you lose connectivity to the, uh, the VCO. So it's uh, frankly not doing a whole lot, um, just showing you the aggregate up and down bandwidth. Um, and it's also uh, going to show you the status uh, of pretty much all your uh, uh, interfaces. So you can see here the three interfaces. This guy right here, the SFP module is connected uh, to the Dell uh, MPLS uh, network. So you can see here SFP1 uh, is already automatically identified uh, as, as Dell. And G6, uh, that's the uh, Ethernet port going to the AT&T modem. So that's automatically detected as well. Uh, and the USB tethered modem uh, Verizon, that's automatically detected. So you see here the, the LAN side IP addresses that was automatically uh, assigned uh, to the device. So it's really just a, a quick means of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of finding which ports are connected to what. But uh, yeah, so since we are connected and I am connected to the, uh, uh, the 
Mellow Cloud Edge, pretty much all the, uh, you know, the features and functions uh, I could access Office 365, uh, no problem. YouTube, also, no problem. Not at all. Oh. Not really oh. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that handsome guy? <laughs> well, I did not know that was coming. Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hate to, uh, uh, yeah. on, the, on the display side for the edge overview, when you're showing all the interfaces, yeah. you're only showing V4 interfaces. Is there any V6 information that's being shown from the actual providers? Verizon's V6 capable, AT&T's V6 capable. Yeah, um, so our current release is IPv4 uh, only. We have IPv6 on the roadmap, so underlay really depends. Or, yeah. Underlay or overlay? We're going to start with the underlay. Um, it really is uh, still on the drawing board as far as uh, uh, what the features are. I'd say, I mean, for the branch customers, uh, we haven't seen a whole large demand for IPv6 yet, so if there is a large demand, then yeah, we will um, incorporate IPv6. So you don't consider like T-Mobile with like 97, 98% V6 native use a big enough driver? You don't see Verizon at 88% V6 native? Big well, I'm consider? not on the commercial side, so I mean, I guess I'll have to defer to the product side, but they have said... No, that, I, I, yeah. I'm just, uh, yeah. it's just an honest question. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It's just not uh, something that uh, I have a say on. I mean, so... Yeah, it's a good uh, question. I, I, it's not come up in the customer conversations we've had, but we can... Well, most of them have no clue that they have V6 available for them as the underlay portion for this side of it, but you should be able to tunnel transport over it, no problem, yeah. at least at a bare minimum on the underlay, right? Yeah. Yeah. They can put whatever V4 they want on top of it, but they're going to provide you V6 on that and more than enough yeah. addresses to do whatever I you mean, want. I mean, we've had conversations with Verizons. We had conversation with uh, uh, T-Mobile. I'm sure it's come up. I just, I'm not really privy, privy to the exact uh, requirements there from, from the service provider side. Obviously, customers, like you say, they don't really care because it's transparent to them. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's the local interface. Um, the other thing I want to show you, of course, is that site-to-site uh, -site, uh, VPN. So, um, actually, let me... Let me go back here. So on the site-to-site -site VPN side, uh, I showed you earlier that uh, there are uh, multiple edge devices uh, configured. So uh, I actually have a, a um, Dell VEF4600 that's running an uh, uh, instance of the uh, edge as a virtual edge on top of a vSphere uh, hypervisor. So this guy uh, has a uh, local LAN IP address of uh, 192.168.110.1, uh, and I have a uh, web server hosted um, on that LAN. So I'm just going to show you the site-to-site uh, -site, uh, connectivity here. So you see here, this guy uh, is on the 110.1 uh, subnet. So my PC, which is connected to the 610, uh, now has site-to-site -site, uh, VPN connectivity uh, to that uh, private 192.168.110 uh, network. So if I run a trace route or, or trace route in uh, Windows terminology, terminology uh, it will show you the exact path that it's taking. And uh, it will show you, first, the packet, of course, goes to the local um, edge interface, 192.168.2.1. Uh, uh, then the next hop, uh, you probably don't recognize that IP address here, that 192.40-something. Uh, That's actually a VeloCloud Edge that's uh, hosted uh, in the Bay Area. That's 66.170.99.1 IP address. That is uh, basically the public IP address uh, for uh, VMware. And that 196.110.100 is the host uh, that's uh, plugged in on my um, VEP4600 uh, on the private LAN. So you see here uh, that this is the actual website that we're hosting, and I could access it um, no problem. So in a single click, uh, I've just bypassed the, uh, the VMware corporate uh, uh, firewall policy, which is uh, not recommended at home, but I'm just showing you uh, uh, from demo purposes. But you can see here the power of that site-to-site -site, um, cloud VPN. I didn't really have to mess with any um, uh, complex CLI configurations or any IPsec or um, ISA KMP um, configurations. All that is done transparently, uh, automatically uh, in the back end. So that is uh, that's showing the uh, basically the, the functionality that, that you can enable uh, right pretty much uh, over the span of the 10 minutes that I've been uh, talking to you. So now that we've seen the functionality, uh, I'd like to show you uh, what the monitoring capabilities that you could uh, execute uh, from the VCO. So first thing here is uh, there's a, a new field that we added, uh, network overview field. Uh, this is just a 
uh, dashboard that shows you the, the, the state or health of your entire um, SD-WAN uh, network. So it shows you which edges have been activated, uh, if um, any of the links, or underlay links, uh, are down at the edges. Um, and if you scroll down here, uh, you'll see things like uh, which uh, um, non valve cloud sites uh, are connected. Uh, and also uh, things like uh, if any of your software versions uh, running on your uh, uh, devices are uh, out of date, so you can kind of schedule your, your maintenance and, and firmware upgrades. So it's, it's a nice handy tool to show you the, uh, the current state of your environment. And of course, we also have the, uh, the map view that will show you exactly where the locations of the devices are. So you can see here, the green one, obviously Santa Clara 610, and all the other uh, devices that I have configured on, on the peninsula. So that part is uh, pretty uh, uh, transparent. And you can see here the Dell 610, uh, it's showing the state of the three underlay networks. Uh, so all three are green, uh, which is good. So we're seeing uh, both the Dell uh, MPLS connection as well as the, uh, the, VM, uh, the Verizon and the AT&T. Uh, all the uh, uh, LTE connections are stable. And if we go and double click on the device itself, uh, you'll see kind of the, the live uh, throughput and, and uh, the stats of the underlay networks, uh, the standard um, uh, metrics, packet loss, jitter, latency, and the bandwidth that's uh, automatically detected um, by the Valve Cloud Edge. So as you can see here, all this is pretty healthy. You'll see the public IPs that are detected uh, for all three interfaces. And if we go into the, uh, the transport tab, we could see in real time uh, what kind of uh, traffic uh, is going across the uh, all three transport. Oh, probably a little bit too fast. There we go. So we do live monitoring, and we could show um, basically the real time TCP uh, and UDP uh, traffic patterns across all three uh, WAN uh, underlays. <coughs> So this is automatically uh, steered on a per packet uh, basis uh, based on what we call the uh, dynamic uh, multi-path optimization, uh, which is the umbrella term to refer to the, uh, the under the hood technology that uh, this guy uses. So I'm curious yeah. about that because everybody in the SD-WAN world has their own special sauce for how they steer traffic. How are you guys doing it under the hood? What is, you know, what are you looking at? Are you using <clears throat> an abstraction for routing, you know, where I've seen a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, SD-WAN providers will do an abstraction for, you know, BGP and prepending. Others will use Linux queuing and a bunch of different ne mechanisms. How do you guys approach that particular problem? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, dynamic multi-path multi optimization um, under the hood. Uh, it's based on um, our proprietary protocol. We call it a VCMP or, or Velocloud Cloud uh, Management uh, Protocol. Okay. Uh, so basically, all the monitoring of the traffic, uh, underlay traffic patterns like uh, packet loss, jitter, and latency, all that is, is monitored um, by the VCMP protocol. Okay. Uh, all the data plane traffic uh, on the VCMP tunnels, uh, all that is, is also tunneled within the VCMP. Okay. Um, so we use ISA, uh, ISA uh, KMP to do the... Uh, so you're looking at individual flows and then packets. managing those? Uh, individual packets. packets. Individual we packets. So you're looking at the packets. actual individual packets and then managing those on paths? Yeah. yeah. Using that using that protocol as, as steering. So we're not really talking about next top routing. This is something no, custom this, inside yes. the overlay that you guys are doing to steer this traffic until it reaches sauce. the I, yes. IP endpoint and becomes routing again. Yeah. So Azure, okay. Assured Application Performance uh, with DMPO, that's, that's kind of the secret sauce and that's probably the unique part of our solution, there are, you know, like you said, vendors that do it on a per flow basis. There are vendors that have like uh, performance based routing or, or some old school uh, routing uh, technologies to, to route applications. We don't really, uh, uh, we've extracted that beyond it. Uh, and we've also automated that uh, mechanism so that you don't have to mess with okay. CLI policies or, or. How does that change the overhead in the appliance and looking at it on a per packet basis versus on a per flow basis? So overhead, uh, as far as you're talking about, as far as just you know, yeah. just compute power in the appliance that you're putting out, is that a, is that put more of a strain on the box that you've got to put out when you're yeah, so at per packet or as versus per flow? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's probably a, a nominal uh, increase on the the CPU uh, as well as perhaps the the, um, the underlay uh, WAN bandwidth. Uh, the thing about it is, I, I think we've kind of underspecced our uh, appliances on the data sheets to kind of account for that uh, okay. overhead. Uh, but of course, we are also releasing uh, platforms that with 
ever more powerful x86 processors, and those are getting cheaper and cheaper uh, every day. Uh, so we're, we're, um, the nominal overhead on the CPU side, we're not really expecting to be much of an issue in production. Yeah, if, you, if you compare competitive platforms like this that are going on a flow base and so forth, and we've looked at this a lot from a cost perspective, it's pretty trivial. Yeah, I mean, and as far as the bandwidth overhead is concerned, um, so, I mean, legacy uh, MPLS, it's, it's more like uh, MPLS is, is guaranteed SLA, but kind of thin uh, uh, pipe uh, and expensive. What we're trying to change the equation to is that you could buy uh, or uh, use cheaper direct internet access or cheaper broadband connections, but perhaps, you know, aggregate and buy more of them. So like, like you see here, I could have like a Verizon or AT&T uh, wireless LTE, or I could have multiple broadband providers provide that extra bandwidth. Uh, but it'll still be cheaper in aggregate, uh, but you'll still, and you'll still get uh, that load balancing and those uh, application uh, assurance mechanisms that's provided uh, by Bell Cloud Edge. So we're not saying that you could rip out your, you should rip out your existing MPLS. What you're saying is that you might want to keep your MPLS for real, you know, truly mission critical stuff, but 90% of the day-to-day uh, -day business traffic, you just send over your broadband or, or even your uh, LTE or 5G or wireless uh, WAN connections. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Words. So yeah, um, so that shows you the, the real-time traffic patterns. Um, and you can also see, um, as far as steering or uh, controlling uh, the traffic, um, right now I don't think we have a whole lot of traffic going on here. But basically, um, by business policy, we could identify difference between uh, high priority traffic and low priority traffic, uh, as well as the uh, SD-WAN control traffic. Um, how we define or uh, what traffic actually gets defined uh, as high priority as opposed to uh, low priority, uh, that we get set on a uh, profile, uh, profile basis uh, for pretty much all devices that share the same profile. Uh, or we could also uh, provision that on a per edge device. Uh, so uh, for this guy, uh, we are just using the, uh, the default out of the box business policy and uh, even out of the box we are able to identify and uh, steer traffic uh, for over 3,000 applications uh, that are based in that are built into uh, the solution but if you had uh, custom applications or if you wanted to change the behavior uh, of a certain application you could do that by introducing your own uh, custom um, business policy or uh, application rules. So right here, for example, uh, we could define a rule for s specifically for Skype audio. So we have the database of applications that are defined. So we could browse through the list, or we could just search on Skype. And you'll see here the various uh, Skype uh, workloads that we uh, automatically are able to identify. I'm just going to select uh, Skype audio, use that. And uh, we also have uh, ability to specify uh, the link uh, steering algorithm uh, that's used. So by default, uh, all uh, traffic is going to be um, automatically load balanced uh, and use DMPO across all WAN links, depending on the, uh, the state of the WAN underlay. Uh, but you can adjust the behavior uh, of that, uh, the application routing uh, based on uh, the application that, uh, that's detected. So here, for example, uh, we can choose, for example, to make the Dell MPLS wired connection the preferred connection. Uh, and then everything else, uh, only if the Dell uh, wired connection uh, becomes degraded, if uh, the latency, jitter, and packet loss uh, exceeds a certain threshold, uh, then uh, the application traffic uh, could be steered to the wireless uh, interfaces. And you could do that on a per uh, connection basis. You could do that on a per interface basis. Select uh, which interface uh, you want to make a um, primary. Uh, and you could do it on a transport uh, group or transport type basis. So uh, you could say, uh, I have multiple wired links. Uh, then you put that, those wired links in the same uh, wired group. Uh, and then put uh, uh, the wireless connections in, in a wireless uh, connection group. So you could prefer wired connections over wireless uh, connections on a per um, application basis. And like I said, all the packets are going to be um, managed uh, and identified uh, using the DMPO on a per packet uh, basis. Can you clarify what the network service entails? Direct MLP oh, path sorry. versus backhaul? Sorry. Let me, uh, oh, you're good. 
Let me go back here and. Sorry, uh, you're saying that network what? service? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, so uh, this is actually also having to do with the DMPO. Uh, so network service, you can see the three uh, categories there. One's very simple. Uh, for low priority traffic by default, we're not going to send that traffic uh, over the uh, uh, overlay, SD-WAN overlay. We're going to send that in direct over the internet, right? So talking about like Facebook or, or non-business critical traffic by default, that's sent direct. Uh, so that, that's the direct tab there. Uh, Real-time mission critical traffic uh, like Skype or, or you know, your Zoom meetings, they by default are going to be uh, marked as multipath um, network service. And multipath just means that uh, whatever WAN connections are available, it's going to be distributed um, automatically based on uh, the conditions of the underlying network. Uh, the other one here, uh, internet backhaul, uh, that is uh, only available for, for web traffic. Uh, this is going to be used for, I guess, traffic that you need to have backhauled uh, to a firewall in the data center or a cloud web service uh, like uh, Zscaler, for example. So if you have, like again, like Facebook-type traffic, you could mark that as internet backhaul, and just that traffic will be sent uh, to the data center or a web security service. And do you have the ability to do anything related to VoIP with like packet racing down multiple uplinks and then discarding whichever one gets there in order to ensure that VoIP traffic stays up? Yeah. Um, and I think you're referring to things like uh, uh, forward error correction. Um, and yeah, so that uh, forward error correction, correction sorry, is uh, implemented uh, automatically if you select uh, multipath uh, and for uh, what we identify as real time. Uh, mission critical traffic. As long as two, uh, those two uh, markers are set, then uh, DMP, uh, the fellow cloud edge is automatically going to implement forward error correction, assuming, it's, say, if uh, packet loss is, uh, exceeds a certain uh, threshold. Uh, and if it detects, for example, like a high jitter or high latency, it'll automatically implement uh, jitter buffering uh, as well. So all that is done under the hoods. So you don't really have to do anything except uh, just specify the application <coughs> and the service class. Cool. Thank you. So what kind of visibility do you have in seeing which path your tra traffic actually took? <coughs> that's a nice troubleshoot problems. Yeah, that's uh, actually an excellent uh, question, and uh, that segues nicely into uh, into my next portion of the demo. So, good job. <laughs> um, so, from a monitoring perspective, uh, we have what we call a uh, quality of experience. So this will uh, basically show you uh, what conditions have been detected uh, for your applications. Uh, on a real-time basis, probably maybe put it at five minutes here. Yeah, that's not good. that's not too interesting. I'll put it at sixty minutes. But okay. So um, now you can see here a couple of uh, bar diagrams here. So the top line is, is fairly obvious. This is the aggregate uh, user experience um, based on the Bell Cloud uh, quality score. It's, it's Basically, a, a sliding scale from one to ten, ten being the best. So anything you know, uh, eight or above is, is probably acceptable uh, from uh, any kind of application's uh, viewpoint. Um, green, of course, is good. Yellow is uh, not so great, and red is like really bad. So you can see here historically the the quality of experience scores uh, varies differently uh, according to the underlays. So obviously. Actually, not obviously. Um, AT&T wireless is uh, actually performing better than the, the Dell wired connection. You might want to talk to your IT guys yeah. about that. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but regardless, um, it'll show you what, what the, the, the traffic patterns that are detected uh, in real time. In this case, um, for the most part, um, the underlay uh, performance uh, on the AT&T side is, um, is best. So that would mean that AT&T is probably going to be selected for most of your real time uh, traffic. But if we uh, kind of actually go into scenarios where um, see, AT&T was maybe not so great, uh, you can see here what exactly caused the uh, QoE score to or QoE to, to be flagged is uh, not so great. In this case, uh, we uh, have detected a rather high upstream uh, latency, 26 milliseconds. If we go under to the underlays, uh, you'll see, OK, AT&T said 26 uh, milliseconds. And if you scroll down here, ooh, and Dell's has 41 milliseconds. You really have to talk to your ideas there. But uh, um, you'll see basically the, the cause of, of what uh, what's degrading the QA experience. And based on that metric, uh, you could see which 
uh, link is, is going to be uh, selected. So in this case, even given the conditions, AT&T is pretty good. Uh, so you'll see probably that the AT&T is going to be uh, using the connection. So a little bit more interesting uh, metric here. So you see the Verizon um, at around 1245, I think. Uh, that uh, Verizon mm -hmm. link uh, is shown uh, pretty critical or, or high uh, jitter. Uh, so you'll see here that the edge has implemented uh, jitter buffering automatically uh, based on the, the high jitter that's been detected. So the net result is that even if uh, your wired or wireless uh, underlay connections are experiencing out, uh, some degradation or, or not doing so well from a quality of experience perspective, uh, we will automatically adjust. Uh, we could do link steering uh, to select the, the WAN connection that is, uh, that is most stable uh, for those kind of workloads. And the net result for the end user, uh, and it's all transparent to the end user, is that their quality of experience will be higher uh, for these kind of applications. And we have those kind of metrics and graphs for both voice and video. I lose connection here. Can you drill down into those and get actual sessions? Actual sessions. So on the monitoring field, uh, this is a high level display. We can go into the troubleshooting tools to get uh, on a per flow um, statistics. That's probably more for the advanced uh, uh, troubleshooting uh, engineers to use. And we could also extract uh, this information uh, via API uh, and shoot that information off to other monitoring tools. Uh, we've just introduced support for SD-WAN uh, monitoring uh, for uh, our VMware VRNI uh, management platform. So if you have uh, VRNI, uh, you can also see the historical QoE reports and, and drill down at a deeper level uh, as far as the, the application flows. You do workflow um, where like if you're starting to drop voice packets, you do packet captures, see what's going on. Oh yes, uh, packet captures. Um, Hold that question, I'll, I'll get to it uh, in just a couple of minutes, but uh, I'll show you what is uh, <coughs> available from a troubleshooting perspective. But uh, just, uh, just to show you real quick, uh, as far as video is concerned, again, video is, is a lot more uh, sensitive. Uh, so again, when, when we're seeing the red, red you see what uh, mitigation mechanisms have automatically been introduced uh, to mitigate some of the uh, uh, the degradations that are detected under underlay. And on the final metric side, uh, we can also monitor transactional status. So this is like non-real-time traffic, uh, things like uh, SharePoint and, and email. So this, uh, it's, we could expect a pretty good performance. Everything is green because it's a lot less sensitive to uh, uh, latency and jitter. So that is uh, the, the monitoring portion. I think I have about the like, 10 minutes left, so I think the remainder, I'll, I'll just uh, review some of the troubleshooting tools uh, available. So um, as far as generating packet captures, um, our operators on the back end um, can uh, actually collect uh, packet captures. Um, since I'm just a field SE, I don't have uh, the access to actually uh, <laughs> generate packet captures myself. Uh, so. Customers, um, if they run into issues, can request a packet ca capture. Uh, so this request will automatically uh, uh, go uh, to our operations staff right here. So request a packet capture. Uh, and our operations staff uh, will then um, capture the, uh, um, initiate the packet capture on the back end uh, using the VCO. If I had the, yeah. That where they could just do it themselves? So, um, Depending on the access level, uh, they can do it themselves. I guess packet captures, as you know, can be a little bit disruptive on the network. So I'd say it's, it can be done. It's just something that we haven't really uh, released to the end user level yet. So it is something that's it's a reasonable request. Um, I think also you do have the ability to uh, do things like packet capture at the local level, at the local GUI. I'm mistaken. Uh, if you have administrative privileges in the system, you can packet capture on any interface. Okay. Uh, you can packet capture on the VLANs, and you can packet capture on your uplink interfaces. Uh, I don't think you can packet capture on the switched interfaces, based on my. Yeah, the route interfaces, you could uh, do a packet capture. Uh, I could show you what it looks like. Uh, I got, I'll have to log into a lab machine. This is production, so I'm not given access to uh, um, 
to do packet captures uh, at the uh, at production level. But I think that, that kind of brings a, a good point up is uh, um, our architecture is based on role-based access controls. Uh, so there are actually three levels of administrative uh, rights. Uh, one is the operator level. The operator level has access to everything. They could run packet captures in real time. They could reset, uh, reboot uh, any part of the infrastructure. So it's, it's uh, really powerful and uh, typically uh, only the, the high-level operators, uh, like the Dell operations team, as well as our operations team, have access to the uh, operator uh, admin accounts. At a slightly lower level is the, uh, the MSPs, or service provider uh, admin accounts. Uh, so these uh, would typically be given to uh, like administrators for like partners or um, other SPs that um, may be reselling uh, the Valve Cloud solution uh, as their own solution. Uh, so the SP admins will have MSP access. So MSP access uh, also uh, has the ability to initiate packet captures, but uh, um, the lowest level, uh, which uh, I'm kind of using, is the uh, enterprise admin. Uh, these are the admin accounts that are, are released to basically end users or end, end customers uh, to manage their, their own environments. So if you have an enterprise admin account, you could request a packet capture, but you're going to have to have somebody with higher privilege to actually uh, initiate those packet captures. But uh, even so, uh, there are a lot of uh, troubleshooting tools uh, that are available uh, from just the enterprise uh, admin level. So, for example, if you wanted to look at the, uh, the real-time flows and uh, what flows are actually going across the edge, you could do the remote diagnostics uh, to track what exactly is, is going on on the edge appliance itself. So there are a bunch of tools here, uh, typical troubleshooting tools. So, like I said, uh, there's really no need for a, a CLI. Uh, so all the, uh, the troubleshooting you could do uh, from uh, the VCO interface. So let me just go through the uh, active flows here. So this will show you uh, in real time what are the flows that are actually going across uh, this edge appliance. Depending on how busy the edge is, uh, it might take a couple of seconds to uh, extract all the information. But as you see here, just uh, using uh, my laptop, you'll see uh, uh, tons of uh, traffic and flows that are uh, detected on the box here. Um, so well, we could use this uh, to identify what kind of paths each application uh, is taking. So for example, I mean, real time uh, traffic, like I said, is going to be uh, load balanced or replicated uh, across uh, multiple WAN connections. Um, Oh yeah, and mission critical traffic like Office 365, uh, this will be replicated, but it'll also be sent uh, to our uh, cloud gateways. Uh, and our cloud gateways are our um, on-ramp and gateways to, to access Office 365 in the most optimal manner. So we have these gateways uh, located throughout the world, probably uh, in close physical proximity to the Office uh, 365 POPs. So this is how we can um, optimize Office uh, 365 traffic uh, throughout the world. So if you're, for example, in Tokyo, then you'd access the VeloCloud gateway in Tokyo, and that VeloCloud gateway will route uh, to the uh, Office 365 uh, pop in Tokyo. So um, that is pretty much the, the secret sauce on the VeloCloud gateway side to, to help optimize what we identify or what you identify uh, as mission-critical traffic based on your business policies. Um, other traffic, which probably will not be so machine critical. So, for example, uh, just yeah, uh, like Windows Marketplace uh, traffic, like uh, hotfixes, updates. Uh, that's not really uh, latency uh, sensitive or anything like that. So, we just send that traffic direct to the cloud, uh, and we still like load balance the traffic uh, based on which WAN connection is has the best conditions. Um, so it's, it's really flexible, and you'll be able to see basically all the behavior on the edge using the troubleshooting tools. Obviously, it's, uh, it's a lot of information to fit inside uh, of dashboard, so we don't have that in the monitoring dashboard just yet. But if you figure out a way to, to make it easier to, to show, uh, maybe that's something that, uh, that we could accommodate. Yeah, I think we're just about yeah. ready to wrap it up. Right. Okay. All right, yeah. So I think that is... Uh, pretty much it. So just one other thing here is uh, um, if you have a scenario um, in the unlikely uh, hood that uh, your hardware uh, may need to be replaced or RMA'd, it's also a very easy flow to do. 
uh, you just request a RMA activation code. So basically, that's the same activation code or um, email that uh, you would use for the initial activation. But this uh, will be used by the replacement uh, after the replacement box is plugged in. So mm -hmm. you just send out that act reactivation uh, email. And so that starts off the RMA process. And then once your replacement box arrives, so Drew has a replacement box, then you just have to factory uh, default uh, the uh, one that's, that you're going to be replacing. And that uh, you could also do very easily by identifying the device itself and initiating a device reset. So one last comment on the devices, because uh, Tomu mentioned it on the, as one of the examples in here. You'll see a, an, another set of hardware available for us under the branding name of VEP, or the Virtual Edge Platform. Very, very similar to the architecture on this, slightly more disk and memory for that, because we plan to typically put a hypervisor on that uh, and then run multiple, multiple VNFs on it. So the SD-WAN Edge box is going to come with just the SD-WAN running bare metal. VEP is going to come with a couple of different hypervisor choices, uh, ESXi, ADVA, uh, ensemble are the two choices that we pre-install on that one, allowing you to then run, if you wanted to, in this particular case, Fellow Cloud as an OVA. We can still support it through this model here in terms of onboarding and so forth, but it gives us place to put other VNFs if you wanted to put a load balancer or whatever else and service chain those together. So just a clarification on that. If you look up the portfolio, you'll see something called VEP, you'll see something called SD-WAN Edge. Same guts, slightly different use case that we're going after on it. So, yep. all right. Okay, yeah, so uh, you can click on an identify uh, button uh, and that will flash the LED uh, for 60 seconds so you could actually identify the, the physical location of the device. Reset configuration, that will just wipe the uh, config configuration of the device and have it ready to be shipped back uh, to your support persons. So that's pretty much it.